Right, so I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to Jeff, our speaker for this evening. So Jeff is the uh, co-founder and CTO of Contrast Security. He's one of the original um, founders of OWASP. He was the chairman for, I believe, nine years. Um, he helped create the OWASP Top 10, among other projects, as I mentioned earlier. He's a conference speaker, and he's got about 25 plus years, is it, in the industry, Jeff? Yeah, we'll just we'll just cap it at 25. We'll just, I'm going to be at 25 years of experience forever. Yeah, I, I've done that on my TV, funny enough. Just 25, that's it. It stopped incrementing. Um, <laughs> uh, also a contributor to various standards and open source projects and uh, considered a pioneer in application security. So tonight he's going to talk to us about um, are we secure? And I'm going to hand over to you now, Jeff. All right, thanks, Dave. I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to share my LinkedIn here. Uh, I'd love it if you guys connect with me to talk about application security. Uh, I do a lot on LinkedIn, so that's a good place to connect. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, so I won't bore you with the details of, of my long career in AppSec, but uh, I will say I'm currently a member of the national champion uh, 50 and over basketball team here in the United States. So next week I'm going to a tournament in Florida to uh, defend our title. So that that's exciting. Uh, let's see what else is interesting that's not AppSec related. I'm I, uh, I'm an accomplished boomerang designer and builder. So made uh, hundreds of boomerangs over the years. I enjoy that and uh, got four kids and I live here on the East Coast, just north of Washington D.C. So let me jump into this talk. Uh, see if I can get my screen sharing going right. So hopefully you can see my slides, yeah? Yeah, all good. All right, fantastic. Okay, so I'm gonna try to tackle this question. It's a question you might hear a lot. It's, are we secure? And it's a perfectly natural question for anybody to ask, but it turns out it's really hard to answer. <laughs> and so I wanna try to push towards a, 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 a way of thinking about answering this question that's productive. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of it today. So this is a kind of a big picture talk. If you're more into like the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of application security, I do a lot of talks on, you know, the details of instrumenting applications for vulnerabilities and talks about uh, library security and S bombs and all that kind of stuff. Um, this one is a more big picture talk about the, the market and how do we improve as a planet at getting better at secure coding. So I, I like to start out with this just to keep everybody focused on the, the point of what we do in AppSec. And you guys all know this, but sometimes when you're deep in the, in the depths of looking at a single app or a single API or you're hacking something, it's, it's easy to forget the big picture. And what we do, securing software is critically important. It's actually number three on the World Economic Forum's list of existential dangers to the world, right after infectious diseases and extreme weather. Then, uh, you know, software security crisis. That's that's how important we are. Everything we care about is now dependent on software, whether it's you know, your government, your elections, your social life, your business, your finances, your power grid. But uh, Dave, I'll pick on you. Do you bank online? Um, I do. Right. So how much do you know about the software that controls your finances? Um, not that much. I know en enough not to um, use it on my mobile. <laughs> okay. So interesting choice. It's just we really don't have any information about it. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know how it was tested. We don't know if it has security problems. We don't know what tools were used on it. We don't know what defenses are in place. We don't know anything that would allow us to make an informed decision about security. And that's the point here is people blindly trust software with pretty much whatever you put in front of them. And it's a weird place that we're in in the market. You wouldn't do that with anything else. Like you wouldn't buy a car without looking at the safety ratings. You wouldn't buy breakfast cereal without looking at the, the ingredients on the side of the box to make sure it's not, you know, 100% sugar and coconut oil. I mean, it's weird that we blindly trust software with so much that's so important. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit. And you know that the market is messed up because 
every time there's a big breach or a big vulnerability or some big announcement, there's outrage. <clears throat> People are shocked, shocked, I say, to learn that Equifax had a library that had a known vulnerability in it and didn't patch it right away. Hey, you and I know that's crazy. Every organization has libraries with known vulnerabilities in them that they didn't patch. But that's not what people expect. People expect almost perfection. They certainly expect a hell of a lot of rigor. And that's everybody from, you know, I, me personally to OWASP, I think that's a much higher bar than what's reality. I think your board of directors would set a higher bar. And even, you know, in the U.S., like Congress gets upset and they issued a, a, a report about the Equifax breach, chastising them for their, their insecurity. When really every company is Equifax. We've got, I mean, there's some real serious problems in our, uh, in the market. Uh, you know, I don't know, I've, I've worked with, I don't know, hundreds of organizations on their AppSec programs over the last 20 years, and they all have vulnerabilities. The average application has 25 vulnerabilities in it, and plus some open source problems. Uh, so, you know, this, this level of outrage tells you that there's a massive disconnect in the market. So the market is broken. And I think it comes down to the fact that we're really not answering the question, are we secure? Now, if you ask somebody that, they'll, you know, the security folks, they'll start saying all kinds of stuff. They'll say, hey, we tested a whole bunch of things and we did uh, uh, ran some tools and a bunch of tools and here's a PDF report and I'm a CISSP and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, they didn't really address the questions, are we secure? And I'm not trying to insult any security folks. I, I proudly count myself among that number, but there are lots of AppSec teams uh, out there that, that have trouble with this question. And it's they're super smart people doing super hard things. But there's a disconnect between what the market's looking for and what AppSec is delivering. I believe that at the core, it's because AppSec isn't transparent. Not the way it should be. We're going to come back to that. But uh, I think there's very little visibility into application security. And there's been a bunch written about the fact that the software market is a market for lemons. Now, if you uh, aren't, aren't familiar with this analogy, it comes from some economics research, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago by a guy named George Akerlof. He won the Nobel Prize for analyzing the used car market. And basically what he said is buyers and sellers don't have the same amount of information about the used cars. So sellers know whether their car is a lemon and buyers don't have any real good way of telling that used cars are, are either a good car or a lemon. And so what that means is that, uh, you know, buyers won't be willing to pay full price for used cars because they have to discount the price that they're willing to pay based on the odds that it might be a lemon. So if there's 50% chance it might be a lemon, then they're only gonna pay 50% on average for the used car. And what Agarloff said was, he said, hey, if that's true, then all the cars in the used car market will be lemons because no sellers can get a fair price for their good car in the used car market. And that he won the Nobel prize for that. And noticing that, it really all comes down to asymmetric information between buyers and sellers. And if you think about the software market, then you can see software is a lot like a used car. You can't tell the difference between a secure online bank and one that's just garbage and full of security holes. And that prevents consumers from making smart choices, which ultimately means that nobody has to work very hard at security because there's no way to, there's no way to get an advantage from it in the market. So we got to do all we can to change that market dynamic. And actually the, the mission of OWASP, at least for all the time I was running it and then for quite a lot longer was to create uh, visibility in the AppSec market so that buyers and sellers could make informed choices about risks. And I think that was a really smart vision for OWASP because that's what's going to end up making a difference. If we don't change the market, then we're just swimming upstream. And all the work we do, all the, the evangelism in the world is never gonna change the fact that, you know, we're fighting against the, the market. 
you can't fight market forces that way. We've got to fix the market. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you're a security person, you might say, hey, hold up, hold up Jeff. <laughs> Don't get out over your skis here. We're doing all these best practices. There's a hundred best practices in OpenSAM. It's not, a, it's not AppSec. We're not the problem. And you might run an AppSec program. You might say, hey, I'm spending millions of dollars on this stuff. We got smart people doing smart things. You're telling me all that's worthless? And I'm not saying it's worthless. I'm saying, yes, it's a lot of work, but it's disconnected and it doesn't answer the question. So, you know, just some facts, despite all this stuff on the on this, all these boxes, the OS top change, OS top 10 has barely changed since I wrote the first one in 2002. And you can tell, cause I wrote WebGoat too, and it's still the same lessons in WebGoat. <laughs> <laughs> that haven't had to really be updated in that time. The average number of vulnerabilities per app has actually gone up slightly over that time from like 22.8 up to, you know, now it's up near 30. And the worst thing is it's the same vulnerabilities. So I, I want you to, you know, suspend your disbelief for a minute here and just think maybe, just maybe these activities don't work. At least maybe not in their current form. Now, it's not like there's a bunch of studies that actually show that doing these activities actually results in more secure code, right? In fact, you could you could say the converse we know to be true. If you do all these things, you're still probably going to have lots of vulnerabilities in your apps. So I like all of these things. I've done every single one of these things. I've made money at it. I've, I've done it for free. I, I mean, I... I enjoy doing all this stuff, but I'm not sure that they actually help. So they definitely all sound like good ideas. Logically, it makes sense. If you're doing, you know, threat modeling, then that should lead to better, uh, you know, defenses and ultimately should result in more secure code, but it doesn't seem to work. And I hate to be like the emperor with no clothes kid, but like maybe these things just don't work. But hopefully you can at least see these things are not, really connected with each other. The threat model isn't based on the actual threat, like measured from production. It's based on just what some smart people think up on a whiteboard. And then the requirements aren't usually directly linked back to the threat model. The requirements come from, you know, standards and other well-meaning people that put together lists of stuff, but they're not really tied back to the threat model. A lot of the testing that goes on, both automated testing by these tools, as well as manual testing, all is not usually connected back to the requirements. Uh, it's just whatever the pen tester wants to test that day. That's a bit of an exaggeration, so forgive me here. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and tools don't really often disclose what they're testing or what they're good at and what they're not good at. So, like, all these activities are not contributing towards a, a shared, better understanding of AppSec. They're just doing stuff. And I, I hate to say that because I, I do a lot of these things. I currently work at a tool vendor company that I founded that does a lot of these things. We do interactive AST and RASP and, uh, you know, static uh, and uh, software composition analysis and a bunch of these things. And I think we're really good at it, but I'm not sure that just doing those things is enough to actually make a difference. And it's, it's useful to ask, like, whose fault is this? And so I like to quote Ice-T, don't hate the play, I hate the game. It's the market that's set up wrong. There's not enough transparency, so people aren't making the right decisions, and it's the market that's holding this down. You can't blame developers for this. Uh, it's really important, I think, that we, we make sure as security folks that we don't blame developers. They've got an incredibly hard job, and they're incredibly smart, and they do incredible work. It's the system that prevents them from doing the right thing. And so we have to be better about helping them. But we gotta be a lot smarter about the whole dynamics of the software market if we wanna change things. So I believe that AppSec is at a crossroads. Option one on the left here is let's keep trying to, to follow a waterfall-based kind of expert-driven siloed approach to security that's slow and expensive has never really delivered much value. That's what most organizations are currently doing. Or 
we can sit down and, and reimagine the work of AppSec so that it answers the question and it can be delivered as a part of normal software development. I'm really much more interested in trying something new. I've been doing this for a long time and, you know, finding cross-site scripting is super fun, but after, you know, your first several thousand of them, it really loses the, the luster. So I'm trying to figure out ways that we can get AppSec to be part of what we do and not a separate activity. So, when people started using the term DevSecOps, I was really excited. I I really like DevOps. That's how we build our software here. And uh, I think it's it's made massive contributions to the way that software gets built. And more importantly, probably to the, the life of developers, it's critically important to, to make that job much more enjoyable. And to fix the market, I, I think, we need to reinvent the work of security and follow the steps that uh, DevSecOps has, or that DevOps has has paid has blazed for us. Um, so I, I, you know, I would have loved to see folks reinvent the work of security. And if you haven't read the Phoenix Project, uh, I'm going to lean on this a little bit. So sorry, you should definitely read it. Uh, go back and and read it as well as the the uh, unicorn project, but there's three ways of DevOps. The first is to create flow. And basically it involves breaking down the work into small pieces and getting it moving from concept all the way into production. And security currently doesn't work that way. We don't say, hey, we're gonna test XSS and you know we're going to solve xss and then you know go through that whole process well what's our defense and how are we going to build it how are we going to test it how are we going to deploy it we push that all the way through and then we go back and work on you know click jacking or expression language injection or whatever the next thing is we don't work that way security works in a very waterfall kind of way you say here's our security requirements and here's our application testing and then at the end you do pen test and i, I don't know it it's very waterfall Ish. And, uh, you know, then the second way of DevOps is to create tight feedback loops. And I'd say we don't do well at that either. The average feedback, the average time to remediate a vulnerability found with static analysis tools is 290 days. That's a massive feedback loop. Really, to do security effectively, we need to cut that down. It should be less than a week. It should be a day, actually. It should be like right in the IDE. Um, so we can improve there. And then the third way is to create a culture of experimentation and learning. And I don't think we have that in AppSec today at all either. Uh, most organizations aren't constantly challenging their threat model and thinking about new ways of making the threat models model simpler and defenses stronger. Instead, it's, you know, a lot of AppSec is practiced in a kind of a, you know, put out the next fire kind of uh, uh, whack-a-mole strategy. So we got some work we can do. Uh, we can reinvent AppSec, but it's gonna take some fundamental changes. The downside uh, of the term DevSecOps is that it's been conscripted by all, all, a lot of AppSec companies. Say, hey, we'll give you DevSecOps. And it really what they mean is that we're gonna take our existing tool and we'll just make developers use it. And it doesn't work very well because most security tools, most AppSec tools are designed for AppSec experts. And uh, putting those tools in the hands of developers isn't usually appropriate. It's too many extra steps, too much required knowledge, too hard to triage the output. And so, you know, the results aren't fantastic. Developers get irritated and they stop using it. And so uh, we end up with problems. So look, I have a I have an idea that I think will make this this approach that I'm talking about to security more concrete. Imagine if there was something that we could build that answers the security question. Imagine it's something concrete. Imagine it's uh, it captures all the output of all those things that we do in AppSec and structures them and organizes them in a way that actually answers the question, the way that someone could read it and say, oh, I understand why you're secure. If we had that, then we could also limit the work that we have to do. 
because only work that contributes to this thing matters. If it doesn't contribute to the, the answering the question, are we secure, then who cares? And I think we waste a huge amount of time in application security doing things that don't matter. A simple example is most pen tests test for SQL injection, right? Well, what if there's no SQL database in that application? That's all just wasted time. And that's just a very simple example. But again, we test lots of things that don't matter. We, uh, so I, I think we can accelerate that process dramatically. I call this approach, by the way, I'll call it security and sunshine. It means, can we come up with a way of sharing information about security in a way that everybody can understand it? That's the path towards fixing the market. And interestingly, uh, the US federal government has figured this out. In the recent executive order from the, uh, from the White House, there's a ton of, of interesting, uh, I guess a lot of it is mostly like directive surrounding application security. And they're, they're pushing for radical change in application security. And the change that they're pushing is around transparency. So you'll see in that standard, you'll see they direct NIST to create a new standard for application security testing. They're mandating SBOMs or software bill of materials. Uh, there's even directives in the, the, in the executive order for NIST to go investigate a, a creating a scheme for labeling software security so that when you buy software or use software on a website, it's going to come with a label that says, hey, this is, you know, this describes the security. And I don't know about you, but like, I wouldn't eat in a restaurant that has a, a, a anything less than an A in the window. And I feel kind of the same way about software is, uh, you know, I'm going to choose the software that's that's been thoroughly tested, that's done the right things for security. So all that is coming. There's a bunch of other stuff going on. The credit card industry is also moving the same direction. If you if you're doing application security on anything that processes credit card data, then you'll need to be starting like about now, you'll need to be compliant with the new PCI software security framework. There's actually three standards underneath that, uh, the software security standard, this is technical requirements, the software security lifecycle, which is process oriented requirements, and the web security standard, which is focused on web technologies and APIs. And you know, together, these things, are going to drive a lot of transparency. Threat modeling is part of these. They're not like the old PCI DSS, which was just kind of a, a simple list of requirements. These are much more detailed. You got to do threat modeling. You've got to provide evidence. You've got to build an argument that that supports why you're trustworthy. And OWASP is moving this direction as well. There's uh, the top ten, the ASVS. The OWASP top ten just added, uh, you know, a, a design flaws section, which helps you focus on, on threat modeling. And I meant to change this. This was supposed to, I was supposed to update this to be the uh, uh, open SAM, but all moving the same direction. Um, so I think over the next few years, what I would expect to see is this year, you're probably gonna have to start generating SBOMs for your software. Next year, you're probably gonna have to be much more transparent about how you're testing your applications. And I can easily see within three years that you're gonna have to be publishing labels describing all the things that you did to secure your applications. That's, I, I really do think that uh, that can happen and it's coming. So how do you get ready? Well, to me and to actually, you know, a lot of the, the standards that NIST is producing, security is fundamentally an argument. Let me explain what I mean. So if you're gonna build an argument about a piece of software, the first step is probably break it down into components because different pieces of your application are going to have different risk models. And so it's important to, you know, I generally think about breaking a web application down into pieces like, hey, what's the, the web piece? What's running on the client side? Maybe it's mobile. Uh, what, are the, what do my APIs look like separate from like the, the web app? And do I have a database or other backend systems? The, those are interesting ways of breaking down kind of the, the zones of an application. But then, and that should be pretty easy. I mean, it's, you know, pick your high level components. The next thing is I think you can pick your one next biggest threat. And 
I don't know what it is. It depends on what you're building and what you're doing. You know, probably it's it's something from the OS top ten. It might be authentication uh, or access control. It might be injection. But pick your one biggest threat and break it down. You, you can choose the level of granularity underneath that. But pick it and work on that threat. Come up with your argument for why you're defended against SQL injection. And there's really no point in working on anything else past your biggest threat. That's where you're going to get the biggest risk reduction. And so you can imagine doing this in a very DevOps kind of way, right? We can focus on the one piece that we care about the most, and then let's get that done. And then we can come back and we can focus on the next biggest risk. And frankly, if you did you know, your major risks this way, you'd be in a lot better shape than you would be if you were just kind of going off a massive list of 300 uh, undifferentiated requirements like the ASVS, for instance. So that's the first step is just pick a threat, map to a component. The next step is create a defense strategy that's really going to prevent that threat from exploiting you. And you probably need to choose a primary defense and maybe a secondary defense. You should think about, like, what are the defenses? Like, let's say I chose clickjacking. Well, what are my defenses against clickjacking? Uh, you know, I could, let, let's say I decide to use the X-Frame Options header. Okay, that's good. Uh, do I have a secondary defense? I don't know. Maybe I'm using CSS or, or something. Or, you know, I need to figure out what my defenses are. Maybe my secondary defense is something more procedural. Like maybe I just want to train my developers about clickjacking so they understand what it is and, and how it works and, and don't make that mistake. But you should figure out the defense strategy for each of your threats. And then once you've done that, then create some evidence to make sure you can justify whether your defenses are either correct and effective or they're not. So uh, for clickjacking, for instance, uh, you could produce some evidence that says, hey, we hooked up a proxy to our test environment. And when we ran our uh, acceptance tests, we measured to make sure that the X-Frame option header was set on every single outbound HTTP request. OK. That's pretty good evidence, actually. Like, if you did that for me, I, I, yeah, that sounds pretty good. How do you know that you hit all, you know, how do you know that your acceptance tests were thorough enough? Well, here's the code coverage report that says that we hit, you know, 80% you know, of our, our code. Okay, that's pretty good. I'd start to believe you based on that. If you're doing testing that doesn't contribute to this argument in some way, I don't see why you should do it anymore. You should just stop. It's like testing for SQL injection when you don't have a SQL database. So doing this, you can, I think, radically focus the testing that you're doing on what matters and not test a whole bunch of stuff that, that doesn't really matter. So now you, let's come back to the question, like, are, are we secure? Well, if you'd built an argument, you could say back to that the person that asks you that, you could say, OK, well, here's the threats that we expect. Uh, tell us if you think differently, but here's what we planned on the, the threats that we understand. Here's how we defend against each of those threats. And here's some evidence that each of those defenses is strong and effective and an argument that ties it all together. And hopefully people look at that and say, oh, wow, that, you know, that, that really does answer my question. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and use this service. So that's good theory, right? But let's talk about some practical guidance in how you can how you could actually do this. Um, the first thing that I think you can do is you can look at all the activities that you're currently doing, threat modeling and SAS scanning and IAS and uh, threat modeling and threat intelligence, all those activities, and think about how they fit into your argument and. There's a, a tool out there called Kialo that's just a general tool for managing a debate. But it's interesting because you could put all the, the pieces of this, structure it into an argument and put it in Kialo and you can actually vote on, on different things. You can take pro and con opinions and you could actually have a rational argument about whether something is secure enough. So I encourage you to look into tooling that will help you build and manage your assurance argument. 
and don't be afraid to uh, to eliminate some of this. If you're doing, uh, you know, SAS testing and DAS testing and IAS and manual pen testing all for the same thing, that might be too much. You should probably pick the the piece of that that's the most effective, maybe the thing that's that's most cost effective. Like it produces great evidence. It's inexpensive to produce. Uh, it's accurate and it's fast and it fits in your development life cycle. Okay, well, you, we'll use that. We can just stop doing the other pieces. Uh, I think it's kind of silly to run every kind of tool for every kind of rule. There's no, you know, like some tools are good at some things and some tools aren't. And uh, maybe I'll take a quick detour here. If you haven't seen, I don't want to do this because this is an OWASP. Uh, oh, I can't get out of this. Uh, let me just pull this up real quick. This is an OWASP talk, so I'll point you to an OWASP project. Um, if you haven't seen the OWASP benchmark, you should. It's, uh, it's really fantastic. This is uh, the, the output from the benchmark tool. The benchmark project is a set of test cases. I think there's over 2,700 test cases, each of which either has a vulnerability or it has something that looks like a vulnerability but isn't, a false positive. And you can run almost any kind of AppSec tool against it. You can see this is just some of the tools it supports. And you can uh, generate a report and then you can take the output and score it against the benchmark to see where you stand. And you can see it's interesting, like static analysis tools tend to end up up here. They find a lot of stuff, but they find a lot of false positives, like 50, 60, 70% false positives. And DAS tools tend to be kind of down here. They find some true positives and they don't generate a lot of false positives, but they do have a lot of missed real vulnerabilities or false negatives. That's the gap. And it, if you use a tool, you should drill into the results. Like, let's say you decide, hey, you know what? We want to use find bugs with the security bugs plugin. Well, then you should know that find bugs is actually really pretty good at insecure cookies and weak randomness. But it's really awful at, uh, you know, F-A-D-E, all these ones like uh, SQL injection, command injection, uh, path traversal, all these, you know, some really interesting, important vulnerabilities are over here. And you know, this tool's just not very good at them. So it's a downside of using a, a free and open source kind of tool. Uh, you know, maybe you're interested in Zap. Here's a relatively recent scan. Zap is different. Zap finds stuff. For sure, it doesn't test for a number of things, right? It doesn't really test for, uh, what is this, LDAP injection or weak encryption. I mean, how could it test for weak encryption, right? It's a DAS tool. Um, it doesn't test for XPath injection. And you can see it's it's obviously missed some true positives as well. So you've got to worry about that with a, with a DAS tool. Personally, I love I asked, uh, the only I asked tool in here is contrast. So I hate to do this, but uh, you know, I asked does really well against the benchmark. Uh, perfect score, 17 seconds, but you make your own decisions, you know, go look for an I asked tool. They tend to do a lot better against this kind of, of scoring. But the point of me raising this was um, that you should choose the evidence that best supports your argument and figure out a way to automatically contribute evidence into your argument automatically. So, uh, you know, every time you run a scan, you should get some results that now link to the appropriate threat. And if that invalidated the argument, like if you got a failed test, then that should fail the argument up this tree to some point uh, where it becomes really critical, right? Because ultimately you want it to be green all around the top levels. So that's an argument. You can shift smart. You can gather your evidence from across the pipeline. People say shift left, but I really kind of hate that. Uh, there's, it's more efficient to do certain kinds of testing a little bit later in the life cycle. You know, once the whole application is assembled and put together, you can do some kinds of tests much more efficiently than you could ever do them if you were trying to do them, you know, like on the code as it's being written in the IDE. So be smart about where you do your tests and then hook up the evidence. In modern pipelines, 
the you know the whole pipeline takes 20 minutes so to say you're doing tests at the end of the pipeline isn't necessarily bad you're still going to get really fast feedback back to the developer that needs it so you know it's not like you're waiting weeks or months to get to a pen test it's you can have really fast feedback even if it's sort of right shifted in the pipeline you are going to have to wrestle with modern full stack distributed apps so modern apps are complicated there's going to be pieces all over the place you're going to have some custom code that's running in a, on a web server in a sort of a traditional uh, monolithic app style but you probably got a bunch of apis they might be hosted somewhere else you might have some serverless functions you might be using different libraries and frameworks in those different environments uh, you might have different backend connections you might not even be connected to the an http connection you might be pulling data off queues or some other backend connection and so i really want you to think about the distributed application is the context that we have to work in and if your tool is only looking at one piece of that like one source code repo you're never going to be able to make very smart decisions about whether something's a real risk or not so more and more you're going to need to find tools that can take data from you know serverless analysis and library analysis and web app analysis and uh, api analysis different pieces and pull all that data together to create a picture of what's going on with security in your application ultimately that's what you're going to need to to build your argument so look for tooling that that does that you should know that uh there's a big push in like the the library analysis piece open source security people are super worked up about that and they should be it's really important uh i was one of the the driving forces to try to get that in into oasp back in 2013. i got it put into the oasp top 10 and i took a lot of fire for doing it at the time people were like that's not a vulnerability and you know what uh i'm vindicated by history once again but uh you don't want to over rotate you don't want to you know spend 80 percent of your uh, application security program just on libraries because most of the risk comes from custom code and actually it's kind of foolish to separate these two things let's do ast and sca at the same time application security testing and software composition analysis are one thing to understand code vulnerabilities you've got to understand the, the libraries that that code is invoking. And to understand library security, you've got to understand how it's used, how those libraries are used by the software. So you really need to do the analysis at the same time. It's one tool that does all that. And uh, you should know a few facts. Modern uh, application contains eh, 100 to 150 libraries on average. But 62% of those libraries are never used. They're never even loaded into memory and they don't present any measurable risk. You wanna focus on the libraries that are active. And even within those active libraries, that 38%, even within those, only 31% of the code inside those libraries actually runs. So just because you have a, you know, log4j in your application, doesn't necessarily mean that it's active. And just because you're using log4j doesn't mean you're using the part of that library that's active. Now, log4j is a kind of poor example because if you have it in your app, you're probably using it in some way. But most libraries are not like that. Uh, there's a lot of un, unused code out there that doesn't present any risk. And you don't wanna distract people with focusing on libraries that aren't risky. Okay. Uh, Couple more practical tips here. I encourage you to optimize for learning. So many, many AppSec programs will focus on mean time to remediate. That's great. Actually, some of them measure, you know, like how many vulnerabilities did you find? And that's okay, that's useful sort of, but it doesn't make anything more secure. Uh, it doesn't really help your program if you pile up 10,000 vulnerabilities in the first week or the first month or the first year. Uh, it's really how much you fix that matters. And so focusing on mean time to remediate 
is probably the best measure of how healthy your AppSec program is. Because uh, if it takes you 290 days to remediate, like uh, you know, the average AppSec tool, uh, average static analysis tool, uh, that's way too long. You're going to pile up a huge backlog of vulnerabilities and stuff's going to get backburnered. It's never going to get fixed and you're not going to improve security. But if you can drive that rate down, and we've seen this, big companies can do this. You can drive the remediation rate down to less than a week. Some can do it in a day. Some big companies can do it in a day. It's actually the most cost-effective way to do security because vulnerabilities get more expensive over time. The, when you discover them, the clock starts running. And as it goes into backlogs and gets triaged and sits in your, your database for a year and your software moves on, that vulnerability gets more and more expensive to fix. They're really cheap to fix if you get the accurate feedback right to developers right when they need it. They can just fix it and move on. And uh, so the most efficient programs are reducing MTTR dramatically. The second chart here is about the vulnerability escape rate. And MTTR is great. It's great to find and fix vulnerabilities fast, but it's even better if you don't introduce those vulnerabilities at all. And so if you can optimize your program for learning, getting developers to not introduce those vulnerabilities in the first place, that's when you've really started winning. So most projects are introducing, I don't know, five or so new vulnerabilities a month, you know, per app. It's a pretty high rate but we can drive that rate down. If they, if you give them accurate feedback in a way that encourages them to learn and adopt a better pattern, that will stick with them. And the next week, they won't introduce that vulnerability. And so we've seen over the course of about a year, you can drive the vulnerability escape rate down to less than one per month, which sounds very manageable to me. Like if it's, there's only one new vulnerability per month per app, that's digestible. That's a healthy AppSec program. So think about what you can do in your process to drive learning about vulnerabilities. And I, I don't, look, I spent a, over a decade doing secure coding training. I wrote an e-learning product, but I don't think that's the solution. I think the, the, the best approach is to teach them the way developers learn on feedback on code that they wrote. Give them that feedback with the right guidance and you'll win them for life. So I also want you to consider the role of runtime protection in application security. Right now, most programs, everything in AppSec talks about sort of the development process and how do we eliminate vulnerabilities and how do we deliver secure code? And it gives very lightweight to the things that happen after you push something to production. Uh, all you got there is kind of a WAF, right? So most organizations just have a WAF. Uh, and WAFs aren't very effective, so people kind of shortchange them. They say, hey, that's not a great solution, so we've got to do better on the code hygiene side of things. Um, I encourage you to look into runtime protection, uh, sometimes called RASP or runtime application self-protection. Runtime protection works from inside the running application and it prevents vulnerabilities from being exploited. So it's not like a WAF where it sits at the perimeter and it has to look at HTTP traffic to decide whether something's vulnerable, or, uh, uh, something's an attack or not. Instead, runtime protection works from inside the running application, a little bit the way that I asked detects vulnerabilities. RASP works from inside and it prevents vulnerabilities from being exploited. So in a way, it's like hardening your application, even if it has known vulnerabilities. So here's an example for expression language injection. The normal path is, is over here on the left. It's these red arrows coming down here. The attacker sends an, a malicious expression. And like Equifax and Spring were examples of this. The attacker sends a malicious expression. It goes through the web app. Eventually, that data ends up inside the expression language injection, which turns it into code and executes it. And attackers can use that to completely take over a web application. A WAF might be able to stop this attack by sitting at this perimeter here and attempting to identify all the different possible expression language syntaxes that might be an attack. It's really hard. 
because there's a bunch of different ways of, of inserting expressions. So it's going to make some mistakes. It's going to overblock and underblock, and that's going to irritate people, and they're going to put it in log mode. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are with most WAFs. There's another path here where that, that a WAF can't help with, and that's when an attacker manages to get some data into something that you trust, like into a database or into a system that you're using, a backend, maybe it's an API. Uh, if they get their attacker, their attack into something that you sort of trust, then that data is gonna flow through your web app. It's gonna flow into the expression language engine and, the exp and uh, we'll talk about the defenses here, but that expression language engine is gonna run it because you trusted it. So then, what defense do you have against that uh, that expression doing harmful things? And that's kind of the second thing that that RASP can do is RASP can block untrusted data from making it to the expression language engine, and it can stop the expression language engine from doing dangerous things. Together, those two capabilities are runtime protection, and they can make your apps much more secure. Uh, we provide a RASP solution. It completely protected our customers from both log for shell and Spring for Shell, even before those vulnerabilities were made public, because it has these fundamental kinds of protections in it to harden your applications. So I, I really recommend using RASP on everything that's public facing uh, and probably internal apps as well. Okay, um, I mentioned labels before. This is actually real. The US is, is investigating it. Singapore and Finland have already adopted labeling schemes for their software. And so the, 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 the Singapore and Finland scheme has four levels. It says, you know, a one star is basic requirements, two is secure by design, three is absence of known common vulnerabilities, and four is resistance against common cyber attacks. So they got this four layer scheme and you get a label that looks just like this. Uh, I think that's really simple and powerful. I, I don't, you know, you can quarrel with the individual levels or whatever, but generally, this is really cool. This is a fast way to decide, hey, did they do basically the right stuff for application security? Um, you can see NIST is already underway in creating a labeling scheme. They've put out a, a document, by the way, it uh, came out a few months ago, that describes their their idea about what a software security labeling scheme might look like. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if this becomes, you know, part of the software market within a few years. And I'm advising you to get ready now. It's going to take a while to, to get all of your applications to, you know, like a level four. And if you're not doing it already, you're going to have to, you're going to have to beef up your program. So a couple of, of docs I wanted to point you out. I, I've spent a long time, time doing security consulting, working with hundreds of organizations on some of the world's most critical software. And I learned a lot of things over those years. So I do try to give back a lot of that knowledge. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love OWASP so much. And I wanted to point you to two documents. One is called How to Vulnerability. And it's just a, a guide on how to write up vulnerabilities that you find. If you're a pen tester or uh, you work in AppSec or you deal with vulnerabilities, it's really useful to know how to write them up correctly. And this is a, a, a recipe format for how to write them up quickly. I used to, <laughs> I had a lot of consultants working for me at one point, and I told them, you should be able to write up a vulnerability in five minutes because they were taking, you know, hours to write up vulnerabilities and it was cutting into our testing time. And I said, no, if you understand what's wrong, you should be able to write it in five minutes. And they pushed back a lot, but after I trained them with the techniques in this article, they all got it. And you can create a very compelling vulnerability write-up in five minutes. Uh, that's the goal. And one that will talk to business uh, very effectively. The other article here is uh, my thoughts on how to change security from something that works, you know, kind of siloed and external to the software building process to actually building it into your software factory and making security a real part of your software factory so that the machinery that's in your software factory, like your development teams and your CI/CD pipelines and your test environments, how all those, how we can reuse all that machinery to generate security, to generate the security argument that I 
spent a lot of time arguing for in this talk. Uh, most of the things that we do in security can be done easily by developers as part of building software. Uh, we don't have to have a whole separate process for doing it. Um, and I think, frankly, if given the right goals, development teams can do security a lot better than security folks because they've, they're have they already in there. They've got access to everything they need. Uh, they can produce the evidence much more cost effectively than we can do it as, as a separate siloed security folks. I shouldn't use the word we because I really consider myself part of development. Uh, and uh, I, I encourage you to stop thinking about you know, sort of us, them, we uh, kind of language and just say, you know, like, uh, what are we doing? How are we building security together? So I'll wrap up with this. Uh, AppSec is definitely in its infancy. We haven't made very much progress in the last 20 years. And that's, uh, I, I um, personally feel bad that we didn't do more to advance the state of software security. Um, I do believe that change is coming. Uh, in, in the form of transparency primarily. I, I think in the near future, you won't use software unless you have a good reason to trust it. And I'm calling on you to try to make this happen. Uh, you can push for transparency within your project, within your organization, within your chapter, within the software market and in the world. As a consumer, you can push for transparency around software security. Uh, we are, uh, Josh Corman used to use this term, we are the cavalry. We have to make this happen. And hopefully I've given you some ideas about uh, you know, ways that you can help push for transparency in the software market. Even if your, your market is just internal to your organization, make it transparent and good things will follow. So with that, I'll pause here. Uh, I'd love to take questions. Anything you have anything related to application security in, in kind of any way, um, I'd love to talk to you about it. Thanks for that, Jeff. That was, uh, that was great. I've got pages and pages of notes I've been scribbling here in front of me. <laughs> well, I'll make all the, I'll send you a, a PDF of these slides. You can make them available however you like. And if you recorded the talk, you're, you're perfectly welcome to make that public as well. That's great. Oh, I will post those two links uh, here in just a second. Yeah, a lot of the, the things you talked about were probably more the US side. One of the things I wanted to, to mention, that here in the UK, uh, we have the uh, sort of regional cyber resilience centre, like um, sort of funded by the police amongst uh, other organisations. And they have this cyber essentials, and what they're trying to do is to try and get SMEs um, and individuals to follow best practices in cybersecurity. Um, yeah. Because the, you know, the, it, the big, it's all right, all the big companies um, doing this, but it's the, you know, the, the supply chain attacks, the, the, the smaller people uh, yeah. as well that, ha that have to be uh, more secure. And we've, with the cyber essentials, um, I think there's like two levels or something when you do self-assessment and so forth. But it's supposed to help you uh, become more security aware. And what I've seen myself in the last year is a change in um, the insurance industry around cyber security. Um, yeah. They'll say, yeah, we'll sell you cyber security insurance. However, yeah. if, you want to get, if you get hacked and you want a, uh, a payout, then you've got to prove that you actually put something in in place you actually yeah you're actually doing something it's funny i um i got involved with a big cyber insurance project in like 1999 or 2000 somewhere back in that time frame and that was the exact story that we were telling then is like hey we'll use insurance and you'll get a discount on your insurance if you do all this security stuff so you better do all the security stuff and it it didn't really affect the software market. I thought it was a good idea. I, I still think it kind of makes logical sense, but it didn't really work. And so I, I'm not sure why. Uh, I don't understand enough about the insurance market to uh, really make that case. But, you know, cyber insurance has not fundamentally changed the software market uh, for security. I saw somebody, I, I guess Aisha wants to talk. 
Uh, yeah, I believe Amanda's got a hand up. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks very yeah. much. Hopefully you can hear me. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, that's important isn't just developers, but it's actually the consumers themselves, the end with IoT and much broader attack surface. How do we deal with that? Or do we just start with the, software, the traditional software development market considering we've now got machine learning, AI, et cetera. Well, I was like, I guess, uh, you know, I think any software that you're trusting to do something, uh, you, you probably want to have an argument that it's trustworthy enough to do it. So, you know, I would, I would start with the most critical things. Uh, you know, if you're using your AI to, to drive your car, like that's probably pretty critical. If you're using it to make financial decisions for you, that's probably pretty critical. Um, but like, I think we should focus on, you know, sort of the most critical software first, because that's where the biggest need is. One thing that you, you mentioned uh, about the sort of the difference between producers and consumers is really interesting. Uh, I studied dozens of different labeling schemes for, uh, you know, not just food and uh, cars, but for drugs, for uh, uh, energy usage, like energy star uh, ratings for yeah, every, everything. Like there's, there are labeling schemes for everything. And what comes out of all that research, when I, I zoom out on all of it, the first person to get affected by transparency is typically not the consumer. Like you'd think, oh, there's a label, so I'll go read the label and then I'll drive the company to do better. But actually consumers didn't start to read nutrition facts labels for decades after they came out. But almost immediately after they came out, producers started creating more healthy foods because their lawyers won't let them put a product on the shelves that said, hey, this is 80% poison. And so really labeling schemes should target the producers first. That's really who ultimately we want to influence with these labels. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I saw another hand go up. I, I don't see it now. Uh, Nicholas, I think, wanted to ask something. You can hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Right. Um, thank you for the talk, uh, by the way. It was very informative. Um, I really agree with the thought process. Um, where I struggle with is the, is the idea of, at the moment, we only have the UK, Finland, and this third country that you mentioned, um, Singapore, that are pushing for these labels. In the yeah. long term, if this becomes the practice, which is what we all want, um, are local governments ideal to enforce this through legislation? Um, how would different local legislations uh, or different countries affect this? Because at the moment, um, different countries have a very wide and very different approach towards security, towards, yeah. even towards like things like uh, intellectual property that like happens with China and the rest of the world, for example. Um, yeah. So do you have any, I know it's perhaps too ahead, but do you have any idea or who you think might be best uh, to take on the role, if it's either through governments, through um, organizations broader than governments themselves, through yeah, Elon my... and Twitter? Yeah, so I think you you point out a good, uh, make a good point that uh, for a long time, it's probably going to be a patchwork of different schemes. My experience is that uh, those never really get worked out. So back in the, the 90s, I worked on the, the common criteria, which was, you know, an attempt to, to unify the security requirements across governments. Uh, you know, like in the U.S., we had the federal criteria in the Orange Book before that. In the, the U.K. had the, I can't remember what the name of it was. Uh, but there's a bunch of different standards that, that tried to get unified. And eventually, the common criteria uh, was negotiated, but it was super complicated. And it never really uh, took off. Then, you know, uh, there's still problems, like, you know, you still have different different preferences between countries. Like 
you know, EU has GDPR, much different privacy requirements than even the United States, uh, which is a little concerning. But, uh, you know, I, I think different companies are going to want to promote their own schemes, at least for a while. I guess for me, it's okay. Uh, because even if there's not one set of standards, they'll all have some common themes and it will drive the the level of AppSec up. Because like what, what matters to me is that software becomes more secure. I don't like, it, it's, it's going to be tough on software vendors for a while and they can put pressure on the different standards bodies to try to unify their standards. But, you know, I think what it means for software is good for humanity. And so I'm, I'm for it. Like that's a, that's a fight we should have because it, it's so important to the future of humanity that we have more secure software. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Hey, Raf. Okay. I got a quick one. So, sure. so could, could be naive, but shouldn't open source be a, a, a um, or had a st head start towards that uh, uh, vision of yours? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit the wrong kind of transparency. Like, I love open source. I, I run a bunch of open source projects. Uh, if you want to check my latest tool, I'll, I'll post a link to that too. Uh, I think you'll like it. Oh, there's two actually. But um, open source is, is transparent in one sense because you can look at the source code. You can build it yourself. You can modify it. You can do things with it. However, all of that doesn't mean that it was thoroughly security tested, right? So you see, you know, a problem like Spring for Shell comes up. It's been there for a long time, but nobody tested it. There was no regression test to make sure that, hey, when Java 9 added a new method uh, that exposed the class loader, that, you know, nobody went back and tested to make sure like, hey, that does that defense against... Uh, JNDI injection, does that still work in Java 9? And it turns out it didn't. And it took us five years to accidentally figure it out. Uh, the amount of open source testing that goes on is pretty trivial. Uh, you know, there's a handful of researchers that find vulnerabilities in open source libraries. They do it for, as volunteers. They do it for free. Uh, mm. That's crazy. What it tells you, what it should tell you, is that the overwhelming majority of vulnerabilities in open source code have not yet been found. They're sitting out there. They're time bombs waiting for someone to discover them. And maybe the bad guys have discovered them. We don't know. But, uh, you know, there's millions of open source libraries and nobody's tested them for security at all. So I, I like the idea of, of source code being open, but it doesn't buy you as much as you think in terms of security. Fair enough. There's uh, Aisha. Yeah. Um, hi, Jeff. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm someone who's um, not in the security field, um, but it's something I'm interested in. Good. Um, and one of the things that I had in mind, which you've actually already answered in your talk, was about labeling. So. Um, in the UK, I work in, I'm a network engineer, so um, in the last year and a half or so, we've been getting lots of um, requests for information about, um, for regarding cyber essentials. And um, I mean, my company is, makes, uh, develops software and we're, we're essentially an ISP for businesses around the country and in the US. Um, so I did my best in you know, writing these and answering these cyber essentials, but I was thinking that um, they're not, there wasn't very detailed. There wasn't, I, I don't feel like they really answered anything. And, you know, if we're just thinking about insurance and um, it, it isn't something that I was very satisfied with myself. Yeah. Um, so it was very interesting with you mentioning the label, um, the labeling system. So that's quite interesting. And I was just curious whether there's within the labeling framework, is there criteria of how you would do um, testing and how you would 
um, show the robustness of your software or of your product or network? Yeah. Uh, so the like in the the existing schemes like Singapore and Finland, and I don't know about the UK, but uh, there's there are standards that uh, detail out a little bit about how applications must be tested and what they must be tested for. The uh, the NIST labeling scheme that they're putting together now, uh, there will be standards. Uh, they, they did recently put out a minimum standard for application security testing, which uh, details, basically it says you have to do threat modeling, you have to test it with some automated tools, and you have to fix any vulnerabilities that you find. And if you do that, then you qualify for having done minimum testing. Um, so not terrible. Um, it, it would be nice if that was tied back to like the threat model a little bit, mm -hmm. because you could end up testing it for a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter and you could miss some things that really do matter. But, uh, you know, I think it, there's going to be, uh, I think the standards, the standards community is going to wrestle with how to, how to measure security testing. Frankly, I think the, the only way to really do it right is to follow the, the basic roadmap that I laid out in this talk of creating an assurance argument that connects the, the threats to the defenses, to the evidence that those defenses are, are correct and effective. Okay. Um, and, and it's going to take the standards community a while oh. to get around to that because they're just going to bumble around. I'm, I'm tired of just like big arbitrary lists of requirements like, you know, NIST 853 has got a zillion requirements in it. And most of them are dumb. Even the ASVS at OWASP is kind of dumb. It's got a bunch of requirements that like might not apply to your application. So, you know, security is going to work better if it's tailored for the app that is supposed to be tested. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things I was noticing as well. A lot of the questions were things that I didn't think were really relevant to our application or what we were doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you, Jeff. That was really interesting. And I'm looking forward to reading your article about um, how to do a quick write-up of any vulnerabilities found. So it's been really interesting. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. Cool. Uh, definitely leave some comments for me. Will do. That did make me laugh when you mentioned about uh, taking five minutes to write up the vulnerability. Uh, <laughs> 25 years as a QA, and I've worked with lots of testers where they find a bug and then they, they create a placeholder because they want to find the next one. So they'll just... Yes. And then they get back to it and think, oh, what was that bug again? And they forgot it. They forgot the everything. They've got to redo all the testing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's like, no, just stop now and just focus on that particular bug and just write it up, you know, you get used to it. But Yeah, yeah I was I was really strict about that. Because by the time you're 80% done with the testing, you should be 80% done with the report. <laughs> and I, it, all the all the testers always want to set aside like, well, I'll set aside two days at the end of the testing engagement to write the report. I'm like, no, 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 that's ridiculous. Cool. Is there any further questions from anyone else? You mentioned RASP. I've been googling it and reading up on it. Does um, a lot of the books that I've been reading, especially coming out of uh, like Google's Project Zero, is like heap and buffer overflows. Yeah. How's RASP against that? Well, RASP is really designed for web applications where the protections against heap and buffer overflows are things like, we would call them ASLR or DEP, like address space randomization or data execution prevention. Those are RASP for C and C++ programs. The runtime protection, because they prevent those kinds of flaws. RASP is for web applications, and it's it's like those other things, but for the kinds of flaws that plague web applications. Things like injection, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, XXC, unsafe deserialization, uh, you know, those kinds of flaws. And RASP weaves in protection into the application as it loads. So it's, you don't have to change anything about the way you build, test, or deploy your code. RASP just hardens it so that it can detect attacks and prevent vulnerabilities from being exploited. And you'd be surprised. You turn it on and RASP will immediately start detecting attacks because the average web application gets attacked 13,000 times a month. 
I can, I can believe that, yeah. But you don't see it because most apps don't have any way of seeing that traffic. They just see, you know, normal web traffic. But all that attack traffic. Now, the cool thing is 99% of those attacks never connect with their intended vulnerability. So, like, it's a path traversal attack that never connects with, like, a file open inside the application. So the important thing is knowing that those attacks never connect with that vulnerability. So then you can push all those off to the side and say, hey, those are all just probes. Somebody's running some scanner tool against us. Let's focus on the ones where the attackers have actually got an attack all the way to the right, the real vulnerability. And let's make sure we block those from compromising our system. So like I said, RASP works from inside the app. It's got a lot more context. And so it's way more accurate than, than WAFs. Sounds interesting for that. Um, any questions for anyone? If you want in the future, I could come back and, and demonstrate it for your chapter yeah. at some point. So you could actually see it and, and feel it. I asked and RASP would be great to take a look at. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, one of the questions I get asked a lot actually is, can you do demos of um, integrating cybersecurity tools into the, the pipeline, you know, the CI, CD? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, any, anything like that, that would be great. Yep, you're going to love it. Yeah, the audience is looking at the chat. They're saying, yep. <laughs> oh, cool. That's that's fun. I mean, look, I, I spent uh, many years as a developer, and I'm really, like, in the weeds kind of guy. I, I built the first version of Contrast. Uh, and so I, that's, I really love the hands-on nuts and bolts kind of deep in the weeds, uh, security stuff. So I'd love to do a talk like that as well. Great. I'll hold you to it then. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I'll talk to Lisa about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No problem. Raf, did you have uh, something else? Yeah. Yeah. Quick one. Um, so my understanding of that process of validation will be quite complicated. Are there any companies that I could outsource that to like, you know, get my, get my software labeled or get oh. my, my process certified with, yeah, that's done is secure or, or something. I'm, I'm quite sure there will be companies that do that. Uh, right now the, the PCI industry yeah. has companies like that. Like, uh, you can become a, uh, I think they call it an approved assessor. And then you can go get a P PCI assessment. Uh, and I imagine it would work similarly to that, is you'd, you'd hire somebody to come in and, you know, look at their stuff, look at your evidence. There's no shortcut, though. Like, you're going to have to create the evidence yourself. The assessor can't come in and, like, create right. the evidence that you did the work to build it securely. You're going to have to show, you're going to have to prove them, give them all the evidence. Maybe they can help you, you know, tie a bow around it and give you a third-party stamp of approval. But there's no shortcuts here. Yeah, all right. So, so you still need to do the legwork yourself. Yeah, you're building That's it. I mean, surprising. it's not like you can build a, a car out of junky parts out of the, the scrapyard and then well, yeah. have some guy come in and go like, okay, well, uh, looks like you did all the right stuff. It's an approved car. Like, you're going to have to give them some evidence that the, the stuff you put together works. Yeah, fair enough. I had to ask, though. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's worth thinking about, but Ultimately, I think doing that work will give you a huge advantage in your sector. Ultimately, the company that's best at building software in every sector will probably come to dominate that sector. This is what Mark Andreessen meant by software is eating the world. He means that your software is going to become your company. So if you want to be great at what your business is, you become great at building software. And... Uh, I think doing security right can make you much more competitive, much more effective. It can allow you to innovate in ways that companies that aren't good at security will really struggle with. But if you're doing it right, then you can boldly go into new markets. Great. Was that the last question? Any more? No? Okay. I think we'll wrap it up. Um, Thanks for that, Jeff. That was great. I've got pages of notes and loads of uh, reading to do. <laughs> and um, yeah. That well, let me know. Don't don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you're I you know particularly if you're interested yeah, in. Uh... Uh, but yeah, no, I've got scribbles. I'm going to go and play with OWASP 
benchmark as well oh, that looks interesting and not not one i've played with before um read more up on rasp and yeah i'll be in touch about you know you coming back and giving us a, a demo sounds good thanks dave thanks everybody for coming out i really appreciate you guys love you for being part of OWASP and uh, keep on carrying the torch thanks jeff thanks cool. all right bye everyone bye y'all bye